Hello everyone, welcome to the next Psych of RPGs videos. Today I'm going to be diving into a specific game like I've been doing in some of my previous videos. As you can see, this time we're going to be diving into the game Blades in the Dark. Uh, and I think Blades in the Dark captures this question, what do you want to do, in probably my favorite way, mechanically. And so we're going to talk about Blades, we're going to talk about decision making, and how Blades has kind of really captured one of my favorite areas of psychology so well. Now, I'm really excited to record this video because I love Blades in the Dark. It's probably one of my favorite systems. I think it bounces back and forth between being either my favorite or second favorite system. I'm in love with it. Right away when I learned about it, I was hooked. You know, I'm really into games like Dishonored. And when I realized that we were sort of seeing a sort of Dishonored and crime game turned into a tabletop game, I knew I had to play it. Uh, Blades is created by John Harper. It came out on Kickstarter a few years ago, and it's it's out in public. It has been for a few years. Since then, there have been a ton of games that have come out that are what are called forged in the dark games, people that are making their own versions of different settings or different uh, variations on the system, but sort of around this core mechanic of maybe scoundrels. And that's what Blades is about. You're scoundrels, you're, you're troublemakers, you're criminals in this city. Uh, and what is cool about it is that you are part of a, a crew. You're essentially a gang, and there are different gangs, and each gang does its own type of crime. So, you know, if you're really into the idea of being a sneaky burglar, then you and your friends can be burglars, essentially. If you're really into uh, making and selling drugs, then you can be that type of gang. The, the, it, it's very customizable in terms of the sort of crime experience that you're going to get. I think many of you know that I'm a sucker for crime games. I make a lot of them myself. So being able to do a lot of different crime in a very cool city is exciting to me. I think the thing that is most exciting to me, though, about Blades in the Dark is the cycle of play. I think John has done a fantastic job of capturing this idea of half of the game is going out and doing crimes. It's doing heists. It's, it's doing whatever the work is that you need to do. And half of it is what is called downtime, where you get to see sort of the other side of life for the characters. It's it's fantastic. Once you really get into the rhythm of the cycle and you get a few sessions in, it's it's incredible to see all the fine little pieces of this machine of the game running together. And the whole game runs around this concept of position and effect. And that's what we're going to focus on for today. Position and effect. Like I said, this game has everything that I love in a game. It's got great art, as you can see. It's about crime. I make crime games, so I'm going to always love any other game about crime. It has classes, which I think is something that is very familiar to folks, especially if you come from like a D&D &D background. You know, like, oh, this is the class that I am. This is what I'm good at. But then on top of that, you are all part of a, a bundle, a crew. So now we're getting to this idea of faction play. And I know folks that like larger scale developments and campaigns, Blades gives you both the individual look and then also a big sort of macro view of how you are affecting this city as a whole. The downtime play cycle, like, like I talked about, once you get that running is really, really nice. And what this game does more so than I think a lot of other games is it embodies that narrative play style that so many people are really into. And it's it's sort of exaggerated and perfectly done through the core mechanic. So here's how Blades works. Whenever you want to do something, you describe what you're doing. GM asks you how you want to do it. Uh, and they ask you how you want to do it because you have a sort of a, a, a skill set. You have a bunch of skills and things that you are good at. And after you describe how you want to accomplish a goal, the GM and you are going to talk about this thing called your positioning and your effect. Your positioning is sort of the amount of risk that is involved in your action. It could be anything from a desperate action, something that's incredibly dangerous. If it goes wrong, you're going to be in huge trouble. To risky, you know, there's some inherent risk to doing it. If, if it doesn't go well, there's going to be some complications or consequences. To controlled, which means this is a piece of cake. It's, it's going to go fine. There's very low risk. It, it should be okay. So you have this sense of position, which is giving us risk. And then there's effect, which is, okay, despite how risky the action is, here's how effective the action is going to be. Uh, it could be great. You could be fantastic at this particular thing. You could be really, really good at it. You could be standard, which is sort of what we usually think of whenever you do something. You do it as well as sort of intended or limited. You're trying something that maybe you're not especially good at. 
And how this game works is that you you make pairs out of these things. So you could be in a desperate situation with limited effect, which is telling you, listen, you're trying something that you are gonna is really gonna bite you if you if you mess this up. And even if you succeed, you're not gonna do very well. But you could also have a desperate action that has great effect, which means you're risking a lot, but if it pays off, it's gonna pay off huge. So we're seeing these sort of combinations of these positioning and effect. Now the game kind of talks about how risky standard is this, you know, the standard role. You know, if we don't want to think too much about if it's desperate or controlled, great or limited, risky standard is always sort of a nice middle point that you can go for. But the really, really important thing here is that this is conversation focused. The player is talking about what they want to do and the GM is giving them feedback in this conversation. We are setting the stakes ahead of the role so that you know as a player, this is my positioning, this is my effect, this is what I'm going to get if it goes right, and this is what I'm going to get if it goes wrong. We know all of that information before you even pick up the dice. And I think that's super, super important. It harkens back to some of the stuff that I talked about in a previous video from a while ago on decision making. I did a video on types of problems and the part one video. And in it, I talked about Galati's model of decision making in which she maps out these sort of very structured style of decision making. It's this five step model that we go through. It's very data driven. It's based off of having lots and lots of information and in fact, Galati's model fits Blades really well because it's about making plans, having goals. You get information in terms of how likely you are to succeed in certain situations. You know what the stakes are. You know what the outcomes are. And then you make a decision on it. It sounds a lot like the thing that we just talked about in Blades. And so I think Galati's model is really helpful. But a big part of this to consider, and this is a limitation of, of Galati's model, is that we are not machines. We aren't always so good at calculating these things or understanding them, or we don't always follow the ideal path that the model sort of predicts that we should follow. We're swayed when we make decisions. Allow me to present to you a scenario. This is a scenario that uh, was, was studied in 1979 originally. I've altered the wording just a little bit to, to sort of modernize it and, and clarify a few points. But Kahneman and Tversky, an economist and a psychologist, gathered together to talk about decision making, how we talk about or how we make decisions. And they came up with this question, which is weirdly timely given everything that is going on right now. But this is the question from 1979. Imagine that the U.S. Is, in, is preparing for the outbreak of an unusual disease, which is expected to kill 600 people. One possible program to combat the disease, to, the disease has been proposed. Basically, here's your thing. A disease is going to hit the U.S. You've got to make a decision. You've got two options, and you've only got these two options. That's really kind of crucial to this. There's no wiggle room. There's no moving around them. You have to choose between these two options. When you show up and you are in this experiment, you might be half of the participants who see this. Option A, if you choose A, 200 people are gonna be saved, okay? If you choose B, well, one third chance that all 600 people are gonna be saved, and then there's a two thirds chance that nobody is gonna be saved. Now look at that, think about your decisions, think about your options here. What would you decide looking in this particular scenario? You might be trying to run some math in your head. You might be trying to think about, um, you know, well, there's a whole host of factors, right, that are going into this decision-making process. The thing is only half of their participants got these prompts. The other half got these prompts. If this program is adopted, if you choose A, 400 people will die. If you choose B, there's a one-third chance that nobody will die and a two-thirds chance that 600 people will die. So half the people got that first set of prompts and the other half got that second half. Did you catch it? Did you see what Kahneman and Tversky were doing with this experiment? The prompt itself, the scenario was the same. It was the options that changed. This is an example of what's called framing, which is sort of how we ask people questions affecting how they make the decisions. The type of framing that we're talking about here is twofold. We're talking about what's called positive and negative framing which is about gains and losses, and then sort of sure bets and risks. So the 
let's look at the prompts on the left, the ones that are about saving people. These are examples of what we would call positively framed scenarios or positively framed outcomes. It's always about saving people. Even in that one third, two thirds thing, it's one third, 600 people will be saved, two thirds that nobody will be saved. It's still in that sense of about saving people, about gains. And the top option is a sure shot. There's no, it's not risky, right? You know the outcome. The option B, well, that's there's some risk going on there. You're you're having to sort of roll the dice on that. The negative framing is about loss. You can see that in the wording. It's about dying. It's about 400 people dying. It's about a one-third chance that nobody will die or a two-thirds chance that 600 people will die. The math of these two things are the exact same, right? Inherent in 200 people being saved is that 400 people are going to die and vice versa. And yet how you are asked the question, which framing you get is going to change the way that you answer the question. The folks who got the positive framing about gains, 72% of them choose option A, which is the sure shot. 72% of people take the given thing. Only about 28% of people are going to take any kind of risk here. If we know we can save these people, guaranteed 200 people saved, most people are going to take that. But if we're talking about negative framing, you can see that the numbers have flipped entirely. If we're talking about losses already, if we know people are going to be dying, then there seems to be this sort of like switch, this transition in how we make our decisions, where suddenly now people are way more likely to roll the dice, to take the chance. It could be an even worse outcome, right? People seek out B here. They're risk-seeking. Because there's a one-third chance that nobody's going to die. You save everybody. But there's also a two-thirds chance that 600 people will die. Everyone's gone. That's a way worse outcome than option A. But people are willing to roll the dice on it. So this is the framing effect. It's all about how you frame a question. Uh, the way that you ask people things is going to change the way that they, they make decisions. I even talked about this a little bit in, when I was in my Necronautilus video, when I talked about false memories and how false memories are created based off of how we ask people to remember things. Same thing goes on here with decision making. When we're talking about positive situations, people are risk aversive. We like to take the sure thing. We, we like the guarantee. It's safe. It's a safe win. But if it's a negative framing, if we already know we're talking about loss here, then I'm going to pick up those dice. Then I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to take a chance on it. I'm, I'm going to be risk seeking in that situation. Kahneman and Tversky talk about this in terms of a thing called prospect theory. So basically, the, the assumption in prospect theory is that loss is heavier. It has a greater weight to it than an equivalent gain. So even if we're talking about equal numbers here, the loss has more weight in terms of how it switches and, and sways your decision making, which means loss is worth avoiding to us. We have sort of a hierarchy then in terms of how we make decisions based off of losses and gains and then sure things versus probable or risky things. And whenever that framing gets presented to us, that hierarchy gets activated. Now, the framing effect exists in real life. It's not just a sort of psychological experiment or an economic experiment. Uh, it's how we phrase advertising, right? Four out of five dentists agree, right? We, we don't talk about that one dentist who really hated that toothpaste and says, this is a garbage toothpaste. Don't use it. We talk about positive framing in that scenario because it puts people in a good mood. It makes them want to talk about gains. They want to go buy that toothpaste. It means they're going to benefit from that toothpaste. We can see this rhetoric used it all over the place, and people purposefully choose positive and negative framing based off of how they want you to be thinking about a particular scenario. So let's bring it back to blades then. Position and effect are essentially talking about the framing effect. It's a different language, right? We're not exactly talking about it as positive and negative and, you know, sure shots versus risky shots. But risk is like one of the actual options, right? Risk is baked into the whole thing. That's what what's what position is. So even though we're using a different language in Blades in the Dark, the framing effect is still being activated. That hierarchy is still a huge part of how we make our decisions. And it changes how players are going to approach scenarios, the, act, the actions that they'll take, the, the outcomes and strategies that they'll use. 
The cool thing, though, about Blades is that the mechanics then mess with framing. We're not just using framing effect as is. The mechanics are leaning into this stuff. John, I, he must know that this is happening, right? When he was when designing this. Desperate actions get you experience in this game. You want people to be risk-seeking. Now, yes, part of that is just because that makes a, a more exciting story than maybe making a bunch of very uh, safe, controlled roles. But thats I think that's part of the idea of the framing effect, is that the risk-seeking thing can be rewarding in the right scenario. So the game is encouraging this sort of risk-seeking stuff. Uh, there are a whole host of abilities that the classes have that are about changing positioning or changing effect. Classes are more effective in certain scenarios so that they bump up that effect from one degree to the next, or they automatically change the positioning when they do that particular thing. The Lurk, for example, is a daredevil. That art right there is a perfect uh, example of the sort of things that you want to see in Blades in the Dark, these, these huge sort of stunts. In those scenarios, when you are seeking out the, the desperate actions, you're not only getting experience, but you actually are more effective in them. That's what I love about Blades in the Dark, is that it it takes a lot of the stuff that we know about decision-making, and especially stuff about the framing effect, and it highlights and emphasizes some of it, and then it really turns some of it on its head by changing the, the way that we are rewarded and the way that we think about the outcomes of those decisions. So obviously, I you know I could be here for hours gushing about how much I love this system. I think it's pretty obvious that I'm I'm a huge fan of it. Not only because the setting and the mechanics are so intertwined, which I think is a really important thing in in games. If you're going to put your game in a particular setting, you know there has to be a purpose to that, and I think it's it's best emphasized in a game of Blades in the Dark, where you you literally have like a map of this city and you can draw all over it as your gang is taking over more territory. It feels very good. And then obviously I love the game because it's it's playing with the framing effect, even if it's not overtly doing it. It's, it's playing with the way that we make our decisions. And that decision-making discussion is part of the game. We know the stakes before we even pick up the dice. Uh, and so I think this is important, right? Mechanics that lean into these things are an indicator of good design. In fact, this is an indicator of great design, in my opinion. So that's it. That's my my video about how much I love Blades in the Dark and specifically how it is related to one of my favorite theories of cognitive psychology about decision making and about the framing effect. If you have any questions about uh, the framing effect or any of the stuff that I talked about, I'm happy to answer them. You can either leave them in the comments below or you can reach out to me on Twitter at GilaRPGs uh, where I'd be happy to try and answer them. Otherwise, I will see you all next time.